Good morning, everyone. This is Tim Gleisner from the Library of Michigan. Uh, today, talking with Mary Doria Russell, author of The Women of the Copper Country uh, from Atria Press, a 2020 Michigan Notable Book Award winner. As always, uh, if you wish to contribute or help out the Library of Michigan, please contact the Library of Michigan Foundation, uh, whose contact information can be found at the beginning or, open, or ending credits of today's segment. And with that, Mary Dory Russell, thank you for being with us today. How are you? I'm just fine. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I just want everyone to know that this is one of the first books that we decided on uh, to be a Michigan Notable Book Award winner. In fact, if memory serves correct, we have a committee of 13 people from around the state of Michigan that decide on this. This is the one that we were very much, very early on, hands down saying, yep, this is one that has to be on the list for this year. I'm very but, Mary, I um, just wanted to say thank you for being here. And I know a lot of people are familiar with your work already, but for those who aren't or those who only know a little bit, what's your background and how did you become a writer? <laughs> Unemployment. Um, <laughs> no, my, uh, I uh, hold a PhD in biological anthropology. You don't see a lot of want ads, okay? I'm just saying. Right. Um, I, uh, when I got out of graduate school, I worked as a, uh, a, a, an anatomist teaching human growth, gross anatomy at the Case Western Reserve University School of Dentistry. Okay. And in the mid 80s, uh, they downsized as many institutions did in the mid 80s. And my entire department, which was the, uh, the Department of Basic Sciences in the dental school, just disappeared. They decided, <laughs> so be careful about dentists who were trained in the late 80s. Um, <laughs> what they decided was that uh, they uh, would have all of the dental students take their basic sciences in the medical school. Okay. Okay. So I didn't actually lose my job. I know right where it is. It's in the medical school and somebody else is doing it now. So um, I had, I was unemployed. And uh, the first thing I did was technical writing and had a very good five year run going from contract to contract, working with engineers, which I loved. <laughs> okay. um, the wonderful thing about engineers is, um, you know, it either works or it doesn't, right? You know, the bridge stays up or it falls down. The software works or it crashes, right? Sure. Uh, not a lot of room for spin, not a lot of room for excuses. Uh, I just loved working with them. I, I had a wonderful time, but 1991, another big recession. Yeah, I remember. And my contracts dried up. So at that point, I had an idea for what I thought was going to be a short story. And um, that turned into The Sparrow and Children of God. And I just keep doing this, you know, I get curious about something and I pull on a string and it just keeps pulling me along. So that's how you end up going from Jesuits in space to the women of the copper country. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask, like, you, you are a prolific writer. Uh, how often? I don't know. I, it takes me three, three years on average to come up with yeah, one. But I mean, you're, you're so renowned. So let me ask, why do you write? Like, how, why, why is it that, you know, you feel compelled to do writing? Is it just to stay employed? Uh, no, uh, again, um, I always tell people if they want to be a writer or something stupid like an anthropologist, marry an engineer, okay, because they get benefits at work, you know, and they're, they're really rational, often very funny people, so I, I recommend them as the backstop, and I was raising a small boy, I could easily have just done that and felt good about it, um, I, I read to learn, mm. I write to understand, Okay. Okay. So if I get curious about something, the first thing I do is go, well, I don't go to the library anymore uh, because it's shut down. But uh, I order a bunch of books and I work through a stack of things. And if somebody has adequately addressed whatever it is that I'm curious about, right? Uh, I'm good. I was like, okay, good. That's a good, good thing. Um, if, if nobody is quite answered what I wanted to know, and it still intrigues me, I will continue to pull on that string. Um, I, uh, I would have to say that the driving force is uh, curiosity. Okay, um, so can I ask, and I, I know this is maybe getting ahead of myself, but what was the curiosity about the topic for this book? What, what um, did that? Yeah, well, oh, it, 
I had just sent the manuscript for Epitaph in. The Epitaph is about the gunfight at the OK Corral. Okay. And what led up to it and what came out of it. And it's not what they say in the movies, okay? okay? Definitely not. There are no, everybody in the movies is like, oh, it was the cattle thieves against the lawmen. Cattle had nothing to do with it. There were no cows involved with what happened at the OK Corral. Just so. Okay, so I want to know, because I didn't read it. <laughs> It took me a big fat book to explain what went on with it, but a lot of it has to do with politics that are just like what we're dealing with today. Uh, anyway, uh, so I had just sent the manuscript in. It was ready to go to press. I'm done. And I, I always think this is the last one. I'm not going to write another one. I'm not, no more books after this. It's too hard. I just want to sit on the back porch and drink gin and tonic, and I'm, you know, I'm done. Um, Sounds good. Yeah, really. It does to me, but I haven't managed it yet. Uh, so I was watching, I, I remember this really clearly because I was watching TV and I do watch way too much TV. Um, I was waiting for the four o'clock ball game to come on. Okay. Big Indians fan. Sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and at three o'clock, I just happened to have PBS on and they had the, um, uh, the documentary Red Metal, hmm. which is about the Calumet strike. Okay. Okay. Now, doing the, the Tombstone book, I had gotten interested in a kind of tangential way with hard rock mining because Tombstone, the only reason that town exists was that it was sitting on top of a gigantic uh, silver deposit. And that's not something, it's not like gold mining where you can like, you know, get a, a thing sure. and like swash it out of the, the creek. You got to have a lot of equipment. It's really labor and, and capital intensive to get copper out of the ground so, or, or silver. So here I am, I'm watching about copper mining in the UP. Now I have no connection to the UP at all. My husband used to go there when he was a kid with his parents. Me, nothing. Okay. Okay, and I'm watching this thing and I see Annie Clements, 25 years old, beautiful girl, head and shoulders taller than everybody else around her, okay, she was 6'3", at a time when Calumet was largely populated by immigrants who came up to the, her shoulders, you know? Um, and she's out in front of the daily marches on this copper strike. And I'm like, how did that work? So there's the, there's the you know, there's always like a, a, a what the hell moment, and then there's an I'll be damned moment. Okay, so the what the hell moment was, how the hell did that work? Here's this young woman and she's leading the parade for a copper strike, but with minors? Huh? So I didn't get that. I'm, so I'm, I'm already, I'm kind of interested. Then we get to James McNaughton, who was the CEO of Calumet and Hecla Mining Corporation. Right. And I went, whoa, okay, now we got a nemesis. We got a good girl. We got a nemesis. You know, I'm, I'm already starting to think there might be a story in here for me. So I just, I was at that level, you know, the ball game came on and I watched it, but it was still in my mind. I, I was on Facebook and I said, you know, I just watched this documentary on PBS and I think there might be a story in this for me to tell. And about 10 minutes later, I heard from my girlfriend, Rivka Tobin, who said, my great grandfather was the last man to die in the Cal Calumet and Hecla mines before Whoa. the strike began. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Ex wow, exactly. Wow. I said, well, I, I need to, I have to take you to breakfast tomorrow, okay? Yeah, <laughs> just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, she then went on the, the internet and printed out for me pictures of her great-grandparents, pictures of her grandfather who becomes Jack Cavisto in the book, um, this is uh, Solomon, Cristo, and Matilda, his wife. They are characters in the book. Yep. Um, and she showed me that they, they're sitting out on the porch of the, of the, ho the company house. And I was telling her, okay, you know, I have, I'm really interested in, in Annie Clements. And she said, well, you know, my great grandfather was not a, not a, um, a union man. Oh. Um, and so I went, okay, that's interesting. Now I got a different way to look at this. Um, and, uh, and I told her about my idea about James McNaughton being the bad guy. And she said, well, I can just tell you this much. In my family, the names of both Annie Clements and James McNaughton were spoken with reverence. 
Oh. With reverence. Yeah, yes, yes, exactly. You know exactly. I went, okay, I have to go, you know, adjust an attitude. Uh, clearly, this is there's more going on here than I first know. Well, yeah, because I had watched a one hour documentary. Okay. So at that point, I started digging. And uh, I, I have to admit that James McNaughton is as close as I have ever come to writing a straight up villain. Uh, I tried to portray him accurately. Right. I used quotes from him wherever I could. I still think he was a, not a nice man. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, I tried to portray him accurately. And uh, that was the kind of thing that brought me in. It was the learning, you know, what, what makes a woman like Annie Clements? In 1913, how does a 25 year old girl step to the fore like this? What is, what is her background? And then putting the, um, the Copper Strike and Calumet in context, where within the, the, the previous two years, you had the uh, triangle shirtwaist, first of all, the strike, the, the shirtwaist, Right. Girls strike, followed by the shirt, triangle shirt waist factory fire, sure. and also the um, the Lawrence Mill girls strike in Massachusetts. Okay, it, that's both. You know, those are within the last two years for Annie in 1913. Sure. Sure. So she's seen two strikes that were really run by and for women, and she's tired of making coffee. <laughs> you know. <laughs> She's been elected the, um, the, the president of the Women's Auxiliary of Local 15 Western Federation of Miners. And she's got this force. She's got these women who are all tired of waiting to find out who's going to be widowed this week. Right. Uh, guys were dying one a week. And that just counts the ones who are dead. They are being maimed, they are being crippled, they are being thrown away like fa factory machinery that's broken. Right. And each woman, every miner that's down in that hole has got an entire family that is dependent on him not getting killed this week. Yeah. So the tension, the, 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 I'm not saying that the men didn't have it bad, but there's a lot going on in every single woman's mind and heart and reality. Sure. Okay, they've got kids to feed, they've got houses, and if the man dies, there is no, there's no insurance, they're out on their ears. They've got to be out by the end of the month because they don't own the house because the company owns the house. So she's working with that pent up energy and anger and protectiveness mm -hmm. and says, all right, we can't make them go on strike, but we can certainly make it clear why we would support a strike. I just thought she was a fabulous person. So yeah, it, it became really important to me to tell that story. So I gotta, I mean, my mind now is going in a million directions. I have so many questions in my mind. So you're in Cleveland or the Cleveland area, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah. how hard was it to conduct the research for this book? You're in Cleveland. It's a long way to the UP for I, Cleveland. I was just saying, <laughs> Even from where I live in yeah, that part of yeah. the Yeah, I had no idea, you know. <laughs> um, and in fact, like most Americans, I, was, I kind of thought the UP was up on top of Wisconsin. You know, I was that far okay. off. I, it took a while for me to get it all cleared out and, you know, like, okay, now I know where it is. Um, so, yeah, it's it, the way I drive, it is a good two-day drive. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a crappy driver and I go really slow and I stop a lot, but it's a two-day drive for me from Cleveland. So yeah. what I did was I drove up and I spent the time in Calumet and in Houghton and you know just walked the streets and got out and it's very the terrain is different. Yeah. Because you've got a lot of secondary growth. It's forested now. Right. As you drive north from Houghton, the, the trees come up right to the road, right? But if you look carefully, they're all, they're maybe this big in diameter. This is stuff that has grown since they stopped clear cutting. Those forests were leveled to make the, the tunnel supports in the mines in the UP and also uh, uh, largely to rebuild Chicago after the fire sure. in the 1800s. So uh, it, it used to be very different looking. But when you get to Calumet, a lot of the buildings are still there. The big sandstone buildings, 
are right there. So you get a real sense of how amazing this place was. About, I would say 50% of the miners' housing is still there. A, a lot of it, it almost looks like a, you know, like a, a dental arcade. All right, I taught in a dental school uh, where a lot of the teeth are missing. You know, there's only like one or two here and there. But you can see what the houses look like. Uh, a lot of them were torn down, but a lot of them are still in use because they were built to last 100 years, and they have. Um, you can't, like Mother Jones says in the book, um, you know, if you don't have good housing in Calumet, your, your workers freeze to death. You, know, okay. you, you can't let them sit out there in the snow. You have to build something that they can live in. Sure. Uh, and they are built to take the snow load that can be 12, 15 feet some, some seasons. Sure. So uh, that's there. Um, I did a lot of, I did the mine tours. Uh, I asked a lot of questions um, and uh, took a lot of notes. And then from then on, I was able to come back to Ohio and the internet and Michigan Technical University have has an amazing archive that's online. Sure. So for yeah. the, um, when the, uh, the governor of Michigan uh, dispatched Michigan troopers to carry a mat because James McNaughton was claiming that there was violence and you know blood in the streets and all of this. Yeah. Um, there was actually a, a a guy who was in charge of that uh, um, deployment, and uh, he wrote a lot of let letters, and I was able to get all those letters from the library because they've all been archived. Sure. Um, I was, I, I kind of thought I understood what his politics were in the situation. I wasn't 100% sure. So that's an example of where I changed the name of a character mm -hmm. because I wasn't certain that I could represent him accurately. With McNaughton, I just used his name. But with, with the Colonel, I wasn't so sure about that. Can I ask a question? So like, just to describe to people, so you know, we, t we think about labor movements in big cities like yours, Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, my hometown of Milwaukee, but really Calumet was different because it was a company town, right? I mean, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Lock, stock, and barrel, it seems yes. in your book to be owned by the company. Yes, it was a wholly owned uh, corporation's asset. Yeah. And anybody who did business there rented the land on which they built their business from the corporation. So when it came time to to decide whether or not you were going to, for example, extend credit to the, to the striking miners. Right. All McNaughton had to do was say, are you planning on being in business next month? Because it's up to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you'd like to continue to have a business, uh, you may want to reconsider that. And so people caved. And uh, only a few people were able to stay in business and do business with the with the striking miners. And I mean, I think that's what's so compelling about the story because these miners, I mean, even their houses, if I'm not mistaken, were everything was houses. When they went on strike, they weren't just risking their jobs, which is it big enough. Yeah. Everything they had was risked. And yes. anybody who supported them, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yes. So those company archives, were you ever able to find those? Are those up in Michigan? Those are up there. Yeah, you can go. Well, for example, at the end of the book, and, you know, spoiler, uh, the, the strike failed. Yeah. Uh, McNaughton was holding all of the cards. And ultimately, he starved them out. And, of course, the thing that didn't break the union, because the, the, the strike w didn't break the strike. The strike went on until April. What broke the miners' hearts was the disaster of Christmas Eve, 1913. Um, do you want to describe children, that, or do you think you 59 want to... children died. Yeah, do you want to describe and, that disaster, or do you want to leave yeah, that? Yeah, it was uh, um, it was a Christmas Eve party for the for the children of the miners. Right. And at that point, it was already pretty clear they were not going to get anything from McNaughton. He was, you know, it, they were beginning to face up to the fact that they were probably going to fail. Sure. But they wanted to give, you know, the kids had been in there, and they're out there, you know, picking up lumps of coal on the, on the railroad lines, you know, that the, the, the railroad firemen would like just pitch a little bit of coal out to keep the, the kids up and they would pick up the, the coal and bring it home for their mothers. And um, they wanted something for the children to remember. Sure. And so they gave this 
this Christmas Eve party, and they they raised like sixty three dollars and fifty nine cents or something like that, and they bought little presents for each of the kids. And then you know, one of the the uh, store uh, owners snuck them a box of candy for the children, uh, and uh, they had one of the, the miners dress up like Chris Kringle, you know, and uh, um, and somebody. And we still don't know to this day who it was or what the motive was, but somebody came to the to the door of the second floor of the Italian hall, which is was a big like a, a banquet hall sort of thing. Um, and they had almost 800, 850 people crammed into this hall. It was big, it was a big building, okay? Sure. But it was still, it was crowded. Um, and somebody came to the top of the stairs and yelled fire. Now remember, again, context is important with this. Everybody at that moment remembered the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. They had seen the photographs. They had seen the girls jumping out of the windows. Right, right, right. The idea of burning to death was fresh in everybody's mind. And they, they rushed for the doors. And there, was, there were 23 stairs, 22 stairs, narrow, tall, steep, and somebody tripped. Probably one of the kids. Mm. You know, these are little kids. A lot of them were like, you know, somebody yeah. tripped. And then somebody tripped over him. And then somebody tripped over them. And then somebody tripped over that. Until finally, the entire stairwell was filled to the top with the bodies of children. And your, your, your descriptions of that, I mean, are just graphic. And I think the part that stuck with me, and maybe you meant it to, is, is when they laid the children out without the shoes. And, yes. and there was a character in the book who, you know, could never see his children again without shoes. And coroner. That, and that, for some reason, just stuck with me. Yeah, the um, coroner was called, and it was Christmas Eve for him too, right? And he was right. home with his kids reading the night before Christmas. And he gets this call saying there's been an accident at the, uh, uh, at the Italian hall. And he's thinking, you know, somebody broke a leg or, you know, he doesn't know. Uh, and he gets there and there is this slaughter. I mean, there are, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of children. And he works through the whole process of bringing in frantic parents, frantic relatives who have to go down these rows of dead children mm. to identify their their loved one and he tags each toe and he goes home and they open the presents with his kids and he forces himself to go through the whole business of writing out 79 death certificates and then he finally goes to bed and he doesn't get up for three days and he and he says i he, he was for, for all the years after he was never able to look at his own children's bare feet without flashing back to that day in, in, after Italian Hall. I mean, this is tragic. So let me... Uh, and immediately, this is what... Immediately, McNaughton tries to turn around and say, oh, well, you know, they just did that to get sympathy. It's a false flag thing. It was... The Union did that. Right. What? <laughs> now, was it... How uh, sick do you have to be to come up with that? I don't want to give too much of your plot away, but for people who don't know this area of the country, you know, or even for the state of Michigan, you know, that was a really polygot place. That's the other part that got me was if I don't, if I'm not mistaken, you were talking about the fact that there were so many different languages. Like 33 languages, yeah. 32. And, you know, maybe the kids did know English, they probably did, but the parents in some cases weren't even native English speakers. Or they were in this hall, you know, to even communicate across this hall, 32 distinct languages in this yeah very tiny community i mean you right know. well they were coming from all over the world at that point right and one of the things that i thought was really quite remarkable is if you read the uh, the descriptions of the time if you read mcnaughton's attitudes towards his towards his workforce uh he considered scandinavians and you don't get any whiter than a bunch of fins you know right. uh he didn't consider them white they were not white anglo-saxon protestants they were right. different and the, uh, the Italians might as well have been African. Sure. Uh, he, and he just, he felt that his entire workforce had gone way downhill since the 1880s and 90s when it was largely uh, people from Wales 
sure. and from Cornwall, who were the miners. And they had generations of, of uh, mining in their backgrounds and were skilled laborers and were, uh, you know, they understood what they were getting themselves into. For the, for the rest of the labor force, like he says, this is the best of the best. I mean, they're pouring in all of these people trying to, all these immigrants right. coming into our country. Uh, but at least the ones that worked as hard as it, you had to work to get to the UP yeah. were the most um, uh, determined. So he was willing to give them that much. Right. Uh, but he wasn't at all convinced that they would ever make good citizens. <laughs> So you, again, you have my mind going a million ways. So what was it about Annie, the main character? What was it about her that she became, she became the symbol, she became the leader. And, you know, what was that process of her becoming that leader? She didn't want to make coffee, as you said, she yeah. wanted to do more. But what was it in that character development? I, th I think it's because she mobilized the women. I think she was the one who did things like, all right, we're getting these flyers from the national uh, uh, office of the Western Federation of Miners. They're in English. But we have a bunch of people here and she would get, she got people who would be able to translate right. into each one of those things. She had, she included the kids in this because as anybody who comes from an immigrant family, you know that if you speak English, you're doing a lot of translation for your parents, sure. whether they're going to the doctor or they're meeting at the school or they're, you know, they have trouble with the, with the landlord, all of that ends up going through the, through the kids. And so uh, you have that element of it. Uh, I think that the other thing may very well have been she was childless. Mm. Um, she had been right. married for seven years at the beginning of this strike and she still did not have any children. Uh, and of course they blamed her, but I'm just guessing. Uh, anyway, um, she, uh, she had the time and the energy and, and she was, she was big her whole life. She was tall. Yeah. By the time she was in, you know, fifth grade, she was already as big as any of the adults in the school. And I, from people I know who got their, their growth early, um, people expect you to behave like an adult. You yeah. might only be 13 years old. Right. But if you're 6'3", <laughs> you know, they, re they respond to you, they, they have expectations of your behavior. Uh, sure. And for Annie, it was when, when she hears somebody ought to, she knows what that means is, I better. Okay. You know, well, she just, she took responsibility. She was of Slovenian background, am I right? Yes. Yeah. And was she an immigrant or was she American born? I can't remember. She was American born. Her parents were born in Slovenia uh, and uh, they moved. Uh, she, she did go, they, the whole family went back to Slovenia when she was a child for a little while. I mean, it wasn't a permanent move. They must have been doing okay because they had enough money to be able to pay to go back to Slovenia for a visit. And then they came back to Calumet. Okay. So uh, I don't know if she spoke with an accent, probably. Yeah. Probably a little bit, but I think that she was fluent in both languages. So let me ask, so you've done all this exhaustive research. You're heading up to the UP on this two-day drive, and, and folks, it is a two-day drive from Cleveland. Yeah. Um, so let me ask, like, uh, how often do you find yourself having to write? How often did you sit down? Do you have, like, a 500-word limit every day? Like, how often do you sit down to actually um, put the paper? Okay, there's usually, uh, and this, this is based on, I'm a scientist, so I think in terms of data points, uh, based on eight data points tonight. Now, uh, my, my pattern is to spend probably three to six months um, on the initial um, uh, reading and research. First of all, to find out, am I still interested? Has anybody already done this job? Um, and, uh, and is there, do I have something to bring to the table on this? Is this a story I can tell in a useful way that nobody else has already done? Sure. Um, I will begin to write. Often it is because I, I, I hear a line of dialogue. I begin to hear it. <laughs> There's a fine line between what I do and things that people take medication for. Uh, when I, when I have a, a notion of a character well enough that I can hear how they would speak. Yeah. Uh, then often the, a ch the opening chapter will be seen from that point of view. I'm, I'm, I'm 
getting a notion of how they're seeing the world. Um, and then uh, it will usually be the first third of the book. I'm not exactly coasting, but I'm drawing on that first big pile of research that I've done. When I get about halfway through it, I almost always have to stop and it's like, okay, now I've kind of used up this big mountain and now I got to climb another big mountain. So I, I have a sense of how far I can get. I also know by the time I get to the middle of the book, I know where I'm going. Pretty much at the, at the beginning of the book, I have a sense of how I'm going to end it. Um, but I do uh, have to stop reading and put my hands on the keyboard, make some prose happen. You can't fix it if it doesn't exist. You got to do it. And so uh, it, midway, there will be another big pile of, of research. And, uh, and then often again, at the very end, usually when I'm done with the first draft, I go back and I start re reading more overarching history of that era to make sure that I'm getting a big enough context. Uh -huh. And also to kind of check my internal facts. Did I get this right? Am I telling this properly? Uh, and um, so that it, it, it kind of keeps going like yeah. that. So what was the hardest part? I mean, like when you got to that midpoint, what did you find you had to research more on? Was it just the overall context? Oh, gee. Um, it was actually kind of fun because I got to the midpoint and that's when Mother Jones shows up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my God. Writing the chapters for Mother Jones was the most fun I have ever had as an author. Really? I just, it was great. Um, first of all, every, every author, I'm, I'm very nearly 70 now. And, um, you know, like, what time is it? Ne next month I'll be 70. Um, I, I'm writing about people who are 25, 14, 15, 32, you know, and, and every author of my age, you can, you can reach back to who you were and who you knew and the, you know, you've got a well to draw on of sure. those previous things. To, to write Mother Jones, it was like, all right, she's 76 and she's got bad knees, you know? <laughs> and she's, she's taking no crap from anybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it was, I could really channel Mother Jones. And she was really fun because she's um, very contemporary in the fact that she did not pull any punches with her language. She was the miner's angel. She loved the miner. She was, she was fierce for labor unions of any kind. And I have a list in the book of the things that she did. You know, the bottle washers in Milwaukee. Right. Right. She was there. Uh, but but the, the miners were special to her, and I'm not quite sure why. But she she was very fond of them as a class of of people, and uh, she always showed up. Uh, and so when she gets the I, I don't know how Mother Jones found out about the strike, but in my book, my character Ava writes to her. That's right. That's right. <laughs> And then later on, Ava writes to Jane Addams, you know, and I think it's just wonderful to just, she's, she's got the courage to say, all right, the worst thing that can happen is that nobody writes back. Yeah. But I'm going to try. So and let me I think that's Ava, Ava, Ava fascinated me, especially her connection with Jane Addams later on. Yeah. Um, was she based on a real character? Was she a composite of characters? She's a composite. She's, she, she, was, she was fictional. Jack Cavisto, her boyfriend. Yes. Is real. But Ava is, was fictional. So everything that happens to Jack, I'm not going to give it away. That's real? Um, His wall? Yes. The, uh, uh, he was, at the age of 15, suddenly um, responsible for a household of five. He had wanted, he didn't want to be a miner. Sure. He wanted to be a machinist. And McNaughton came to his mother while his father was lying the crushed skull in the hospital and said, as long as one of your sons is working underground, you can stay in the house. And after uh, a certain amount of time has passed, you'll get free title to the house. 50 years. 50, yeah, that's right. 50 years of indentured labor for a clabbered house in Calumet, Michigan. Right. And she, that's why his name was spoken with reverence. She was grateful for that because the alternative was hit the road. Right. 
Um, and so uh, he suddenly, she has written a check that he has to cash. Jack has to go underground to keep his family from losing the house. And for him, the, um, the strike was a godsend because he could get the hell out of there. And he wanted to go anywhere else sure. and, and work above ground. Um, Rivka, that's Rivka's grandfather. Okay, your friend. Yes. And so she remembered Jack Visto as a bitter, angry, violent old man. And he raised bitter, angry, violent sons. I mean, her father broke her arm with a ball peen hammer. Oh. Yeah, I'm telling you, this is like there's some major league dysfunction that comes down the generations. Oh. So what she did also remember of her grandfather is that when she was about, I think, 14, 14 is an important age. I always have a 14-year-old in, in my books, if I can. Because okay. um, they're, they're, they're like right on the cusp of adulthood. Sure. You know, they're looking at the world and saying, why does it have to be like that? Right. You know, 14 is a great age. So she went up to Calumet with her grandfather. He drove up there, like 1963 or something. They got to Italian Hall and it was still intact. The building was still there. And her grandfather pulled the car over, turned the engine off and sobbed for 20 minutes. Turned the key, started the car, drove away and never explained. Did she, she, yeah. okay. she had no idea. She had no she idea had about the- no car. idea. So did part of what I was doing- that with fire? Did he live through that fire? Or did he just know a bunch Jack of- Jack Cavista was, yeah, he was, he was there. Right, right, okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, he would have had memories of that. Uh, he, he, none of her family died because Jack doesn't let his younger brothers and sisters go. Right. Right? They are not union. Yeah. So he, he, they're, they're not, they won't be welcome there. Um, but he, I had to, those were my dots that I was trying to connect for her to say, what was this like for your grandfather? Of course he was bitter. Of course he was angry. Jeez, who wouldn't be? Right. Um, and then he wanted to get out and he knew what his, you know, he was on the wrong side. He was on the wrong side and he saw what happened. And it's like, yeah, yeah. He just, he, there was a lot, I think a lot of, of uh, um, regret yeah. and shame and things that he didn't want to talk about. The men of, the, of that generation and men of, of and he's a Finn, for God's sake. Finns don't talk even when they feel good. So, you know. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I'm trying, that's what I do with, the, with these books is that I will have, there are, there are dots and they need to be connected. You build the connection. And I need to make the connections and do it in a way that makes the, the known behavior of people um, understandable. Maybe you're not going to um, admire it, but right. at least you get what was going on in their heads when they did it. Sure. That's the, that's the job as far as I'm concerned. So let me ask, you alluded to this much earlier, but your book, what do you think is the relevance to today? Well, First, there's, there's two. There's two. I mean, first of all, the union movement peaked in the late 40s and 50s and 60s. Yeah. Okay. That was when, that was the last great American prosperity. And there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah, we were the last guy standing after World War II. Everybody else's industrial uh, uh, capacity had been leveled during the war. But nevertheless, that was when we had an eight hour day and a five day week and overtime and pensions you could retire on and uh, safe working conditions. And all of that was something that was just taken for credit. Now, in the years following, we have seen a, a relentless clawback by corporations, right to work laws. Uh, you know, all of this stuff that makes it harder and harder to, to, to organize and to bargain collectively. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they have a board of directors that bargains collectively for all their shareholders, but somehow it's communism. <laughs> Workers have 
a union and a, a, a union people who go out and, and, and bargain for them. Right, right. Um, so there's a, there's a basic mismatch in power. And that's one of the things I wanted people to see is that, you know, people, men, women, and children died for decent lives for, for the workers who came after them. And we need to remember how hard that was. We need to honor what they did and, and carry on. Now, what this, the, the first draft of this book was completed about three days before the last presidential election. Okay. I had originally thought that I was writing an homage. I was writing something to honor the, the women who stepped up and did all that and that had had ended with finally breaking the glass ceiling. Yep. <laughs> I thought Hillary was going to win. Even Trump thought Hillary was going to win. So, you know, it was a big surprise to everybody. Yep. And that was when I realized that I had to take the end of that book and, and shift the emphasis a little bit. Moshe Glass, another real guy. Okay, Moshe Glass is the guy who runs the store, who gives yeah. the credit to the, okay, Moshe Glass is real. And what he says is, okay, fine. What do you do if you lose? You gotta have plan B and plan C and plan D. You, you have to, you know, he, he, he isn't telling them you don't strike. Right. But he's saying, what do you do if you lose? Sure. What's your next step? And so that becomes uh, how um, Eva and me, and I make sense of what has happened. You find another battle, you fight again. You don't give up. You don't walk away. You don't. You you keep on fighting. And she and goes. Mother, that's Mother Jones right there. And she goes to Jane. I mean that I've been yes. to Hull House Museum in Chicago, and I yes. I was fascinated with Eva's choice. Uh, you know, when she ended up. Well, she's. You know, it made good sense for her to do that. As I mean, though she's a fictional character, she has to be. be re she, if you're writing a good character, if your if your fictional character has some internal integrity, yeah, it's much easier for a novelist to say, well, what would she do? Who else is around? What what would be? She has learned all these things. Pick another battle. Don't give up. Uh, use all your tools. Uh, you know, you, you can do more with a group than you can as a single person. So what, what does she do? Well, there's Jane Addams. Right. Who is in a, a with an immigrant uh, population in Chicago. Uh, she is making schools. She's making, she's what, got this old house, Hull House, that she talks a rich friend into giving to her. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it was just an extraordinary story. And I wanted to bring... Um, it, I didn't start out to write about all of the women who were so important at the turn of the, cent the last century, but it ended up being about them. I just kept finding these women who didn't just sit home and wait for something to, good to happen. They went mm -hmm. out and made it happen. Uh, and so she writes to Jane uh, Adams and says, look, I speak, uh, you know, Polish. Right. A little bit of this and a little bit of that, and so and I know how to. She she's trained with a midwife, and she she's she knows how to take care of babies, and she's she's good with kids, and she wants to help. And Jane Adams says, "Come." And I think that's fascinating. Right? The thing that fascinated me, and it shouldn't really, but you know that connection to Chicago, because really, I mean, all these Great Lakes cities and towns, they would know about what's going on. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And that's the other thing that really fascinated me too was Kelly Met was really under uh, under stress, not trying to, to the you know uh, justify McNaughton, but they had stress from other copper mining areas. Yes. But yes. You know, the thing that I've always heard about being in Michigan is Henry Ford's five dollar was it five dollar a day, right? Yeah, I mean, they can't pay those people up there, and there are people who are saying, "I'm going to go to Detroit." They were asking for th three dollars a day. Right. That's what the miners wanted. Three dollars a day. Yeah. And and they were against the one man drill because it was so much more dangerous than the two man drill. Working okay. by yourself was really doubling your danger. Sure. And and McNaughton was just like, well, you know, we're gonna go to the one man drill and that's gonna we really only need about half of the workers that we've got right now. Automation is already happening in 1913. Right. Uh, and so his attitude is great, go to Detroit. Then I don't even have to fire you. He was, he was like, I'll pay for your 
your train ticket. Get the right. hell out of town. You know, as far as he was concerned, that was a win-win. Um, and the copper industry was, in general, Kelly met by the time you get to 1913. The copper mining, the, the, uh, the copper deposits are really, really deep. They're like a mile and a half, two miles down. Whoa. You're getting to the point where you have to run the pumps all the time. Sure. That's a lot of rock on top of things. Um, and which is what they were having cave-ins and it was more and more dangerous and less and less profitable. Out in near Tombstone, Arizona, for example, I toured, before I knew I was going to write this, I toured the Bisbee Copper Mines and that's a surface mine. And it was a hell of a lot easier to just blow it up and then yeah. come along and pick up the ore. You didn't have to do all that infrastructure to get down to where the, the copper was still there. And you had the same kind of thing going on in, uh, uh, in the Rockies elsewhere too. There were mines that were much, much cheaper to run. Sure. And even those mines, Bismi went out of business because it was cheaper to mine in Chile. Okay. So there you go. Yeah, it right. was always, you know, if you're, if you're an extractive industry, you will get to the end of where it makes any sense to keep pulling it out of the ground. So, in this book, who is your favorite character? What's your favorite scene in the book? Or, I, oh, maybe Mother, Mother Jones. Mother Jones. Mother Jones. <laughs> <laughs> He's a yeah, um, the, I never do readings, okay? I usually, well, you know, this is, all the Zoom stuff is really new to me. Um, and uh, ordinarily, I would do, uh, you know, like about a 20 minute talk about where the idea came. Basically, this, this kind of conversation only written out so that it's not so many uhs and you know um, and uh i'm used to that so i am also used to how do you hold an audience like i like an audience you know i like the feedback and i and i and i watch a lot of of uh, comedy central i take notes watching you know <laughs> uh, comics uh timing and mother jones would have had vaudeville uh, and uh, uh, she would have learned from the, from the entertainers around her how to work a crowd. And so what I did was uh, I, I had all of the quotes from her. I knew what, she, what her life was like, and I was able to use my own um, uh, experience in, in working a crowd and giving a talk. Now, she would talk for two and a half hours. You know, one... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm done after an hour. If we did 20 minutes to talk and an, another 40 minutes to answer questions, and then it's like, I got to go lay down. I think uh, that's fair. She, <laughs> <laughs> she would go she would talk for two, two and a half hours. It's amazing. So, yeah, so she was definitely my favorite. Okay. And, and so you're chosen as a Michigan Notable Book author. How'd that feel? Oh, it was such validation. Um, like I said, I didn't have any, any personal connection to this. Right. Uh, and um, so the people who read for me, I would try to get people who did have a connection, like Rivka, whose family, the Cavistos, is, uh, is, is in here. And I, uh, uh, she bought a copy of this book for everybody she, in her family. Oh, my <laughs> you know? gosh, really? She felt that I had, I had connected the dots for her. She, she, I had made Jack make sense to her. Uh, and uh, it... It, uh, there was kind of a well of, um, of resentment and, and um, misunderstanding and, and, and sadness and anger and all of that. And I was able to at least give a little bit of a, the, the, the context of what made him the man he was. Okay. Uh, so uh, having the, the Michigan library system pick it out of the welter of books. You know, every year there's like a, a bazillion books. And, and I always, I walk into bookstores back when we could walk into bookstores and I go, how out of all of these books is anyone ever going to find one of mine, you know? Um, so to have an entire library system pluck it from relative obscurity and say, here, read this. <laughs> it's, it's, it's wonderful. It is just wonderful. So you've given so much today, and I want to ask one final question, right? Why do you think someone should read Women of the Copper Country? What, 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 do, you, what do you think people should get out of this? Is it is the political angle? Tell us what you think it is. I, I, well, particularly now, when we're coming up to another very important election. Yes. And not just at the top, top to bottom. 
uh, you know, the local dog catcher. Everybody is going to have, and in fact, usually the local uh, uh, elections are going to affect individuals more than the ones at the top, although this has been anomalous in many ways. But also, I want people to remember on Labor Day, it's not just an excuse to have a picnic. Right. It's to remember the men and the women and the children who fought and worked and died for decent lives for working people. And mm -hmm. I think it's really important. If, if you read this, I think Labor Day is going to make a difference to you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to you all, everyone watching today. Uh, we've been with Mary Doria Russell, uh, Women of the Copper Country by Atria Press. Um, and again, if you wish to contribute to the Michigan Notable Book Program, please contact the Library of Michigan Foundation, whose contact information will be found at the beginning and ending of this segment. And Ms. Russell, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for being here today. Any closing comments you'd like to make? Thank you for your interest. I really appreciate it. Oh, it was a wonderful book. And thank you and have a great day. You too.